doesn't take very many. It can be just two or three. And I feel that same sweet spirit that I felt of times before. Surely I can say I've been with the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. There's a holy hush around us as God's glory fills this place. I've touched the hem of his garment. I can almost see his face and my heart is overflowing with the fullness of his joy. I know without a doubt that I've been with the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in You join in our responsive call to worship as printed in the bulletin and is taken from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye shining stars, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn number 412, Eternal God Whose Power Upholds.
In John's Gospel, Jesus says, If you walk in darkness, you don't know where you're going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you might become children of the light. In John's Gospel, sin is defined as turning your back on God, as revealed to us in the life of Jesus. So let us confess to the times we have turned away from the light of Christ as a community and then individually in our time of silent confession. Let us pray together. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail to fulfill your will. Though you have bound yourself to us, we will not bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, you serve us freely, but we refuse your love and withhold ourselves from others. We do not love you fully, or love one another as you command. In your mercy, forgive and cleanse us, for we have failed to live by the new commandment of love, which has expanded the circle of your church to include people of every circumstance and every race and nation. We make this prayer in Christ's name. For God so loved the world that God sent God's only Son. And through believing in Him, we may have life in Him. Come to the light and know that you are reconciled to God. them by transfer, we shall receive uh, Eric by profession of faith. He was baptized uh, as an infant, and he has been in a one-on-one uh, -one, uh, one -on -one conservation class with Sheila Barrett and with myself and David Custis. So we welcome his family into the fellowship of First Presbyterian Church. Uh, Bob has served as an elder and a deacon. At one time, there were members of the Alamance Presbyterian Church outside of Greensboro and knew uh, Jim Ellis, and he served there associate pastor, which I've always served here as an associate pastor. So we're thankful for the ties uh, which bind us together. Uh, Tori and Courtney are students at Wake uh, Stephen Technical Community College. And Eric is a 10th grader at Gorham Senior High School. Robert and Randy and Tori and Courtney, who have been received into the membership of this congregation by transfer of letter. And as we receive you, we confirm by this and acknowledge by this that we are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And because of this, you do not come to us as strangers, but as a brother and sister in the Lord. The sense of unity in the body of Christ which is talked about and spoken about uh, in the written word in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, where it is written, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord? We respond by saying, I do. Thank you. Bob will have the prayer. Thank you, Father. 
I just wanted to say uh, one word that when I first called Randy, I had to be one of the few people in the church that knew that the town in Ohio that looks like it is Bellefontaine is pronounced Bell Fountain. I was born there, Mary Rutan Hospital. So. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for Bob and Randy Hempy and Tori and Courtney joining us today and for the baseball star Eric who has made time to complete his confirmation. As we relish uh, their joining us, may we all reconfirm our faith and write anew our faith statements so that together we may live in your spirit and have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Bob is right because when I saw the name, it, it looks like you ought to say it because I grew up in South Louisiana. It's Bellefontaine. Uh, the way it is spelled B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So, Eric, it's good to have you with us. You were baptized, and I'd like for you to step forward, please. Step over that cord. There you go. It's hard to believe that he's a 10th grader. He looks older than he is. And we're thankful that uh, he has gone through this confirmation class and has completed the requirements. Sheila Barrick uh, coordinates this for us, and she will be assisting me in the reception of Eric Hempe. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Eric, Jesus Christ has chosen you, and in baptism has joined you to himself, and your parents presented you for baptism as an infant. He has called you, and together with us, into the church, which is his body. Now he has brought you to this time and place so that you may confess his name before all and go out to serve him as a faithful disciple. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you, you trust in him? Yes. Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? If you can turn around and kneel, Eric, he is a baseball player, so his knees are in good shape still. <laughs> I don't think I could get down that easy and get up that easy. Let us have our prayer. Gracious God, we ask that we confirm by the power of your Holy Spirit the vows taken long ago for Eric when he was an infant. We're thankful for the nurture of love in the community of faith and through family and through the covenant community that Eric has now come to the place where, as a young adult, he has confirmed these vows taken long ago. He has confirmed them as a disciple of Christ, that he is able to live in them and to practice them and to grow in them and to serve you as a disciple of Jesus the Christ. And so we celebrate this day his confirmation of these vows and his professing you as Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Eric, you're now a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord, and we ask that you go out and to serve him. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray your special blessing on Eric today. He has come confessing his faith in Jesus Christ and seeking to serve you as a faithful member of the church. May this step in his faith journey be followed by many others as he grows in discipleship and an understanding of your will and purpose for his life. May he learn and grow through active participation in church school, youth fellowship, and worship. May he be strengthened through his faith to withstand temptation and empowered to serve you. We thank you for his family who has loved and nurtured him, bringing him to this time and place. Bless him as he grows in wisdom and statue and in favor with you and others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tori, welcome. Courtney, Randy, Robert, and Eric. Big Eric. Okay. They go down. Okay. At the close of the worship service after the benediction, I invite you to come forward to extend a right hand of fellowship to our new members. Uh, please introduce yourself to David Kesterson so that he in turn may introduce you to uh, members of the family. Again, good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian on this beautiful day. It is Mother's Day. 
It is the Lord's Day, and we're glad that you're here, both members and guests alike. And we do have many guests and visitors uh, who are here because of Mother's Day. I invite you now to participate in the ritual of friendship. On the center aisle is a friendship pad. Uh, please sign and pass it along the pew, observing uh, the names of others in worship with you on this Sunday. At the appropriate time, please extend to them a very warm and cordial welcome. We have uh, so a lot of visitors today. It would be helpful to us if uh, you would reach for uh, a red ribbon and a card in front of you and put that on. Uh, it would be helpful to those sitting in front of you or behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship pad. If you're looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship. We have been serving our Lord from this downtown location since 1816. This is an exciting time to be in the life of the church. We have dedicated a new 38,000 square foot facility which anchors our presence here in downtown for decades to come, and that is intentional. We feel called to serve our Lord from this downtown location, and members come from all over Wake County and beyond. It does take a sacrifice of, of time and distance, but this is a very special congregation with a special chemistry, and folks who are already members have made that commitment. We found out in taking a survey that uh, most of our members uh, travel in at least 10 and a half miles, unless you're Steve Matthews and come in from Clayton, there must be 25 or 30. We have others who come in from that distance as well or beyond. If you are looking for a church home, uh, there's a place to check on the friendship page, your interest in receiving information about the church or in a visit from a member of the church or from the staff. If you would like to speak with someone at the close of the service, there will be an elder in this room to my right who will be prepared to talk with you about how one does become a member of this body of Christ. Also in this room will be a Stephen minister with whom you can share information. In the pews are lavender cards for prayer requests. We have a very active intercessory prayer group. Those cards may be turned in and placed in the offering plate, or you may put them in one of the wooden boxes uh, in the vestibules, the entrance waves into the sanctuary area. They're taken seriously, and there's a group which prays for these requests each week. As the session met this Sunday morning, we received the Hempy family, but it also took a significant action to acknowledge uh, the nurture of this church and the opportunities we, we provide uh, adults and young people to serve our Lord in many special ways. And so B. Hayden, who just graduated from Peace College yesterday, uh, was confirmed by the uh, session upon recommendation of the mission committee to be a volunteer in mission for the Presbyterian Church USA in Argentina. Uh, she speaks Spanish fluently, a uh, double major, has been on various mission trips for the church, Haiti and Korea and Bolivia. And she doesn't know I'm going to do this, but so you know who she is. Uh, she's been so busy studying, maybe you haven't seen as much of her each week, but she's sitting back there on a pew. Correct? Yes, I heard a voice laughing. Okay, B. Hayden, our prayers go with you in the weeks to come as uh, you make plans to indeed uh, go to Argentina and to represent all of us in the Presbyterian Church USA. Thank you. At the close of the worship service, uh, the pastors will uh, go to the uh, Balkan Parlor, which is a room to my right, where I trust there will be coffee at the close of this service. I always say that because sometimes there's a run on coffee, and before I get there, it's, it's all been drunk, so uh, all consumed. But we look forward to greeting you there. If you're sitting next to several visitors or individual, a couple, please invite those individuals to the Balkan Parlor, and the pastors, after we greet at the doors, will go there, and we look forward to greeting you there. At this time, we will have our participation in the uh, Old Adult Litany by a member of that committee, Jean Crow. Please join me as we read responsively the litany prayer, which is found in your bulletin. Today we celebrate aging for all ages. We thank you, loving God, that you have allowed us to live for another day and have granted us the sure knowledge of your faithfulness throughout this day and all the days to come. We believe in the unique worth of every aging person. O oh God, we are thankful for all those people older than we are who brought us to this place in our faith and who have protected and nourished the church 
and who have given us a good model for aging. We believe life is an ongoing process of growth and change. Gracious God, never let us forget those older and wiser members of our church family who can't be with us today because of physical limitations and illnesses. Bless them and help us to find ways to take the church to them wherever they are. We believe that the elderly are pioneers of a new era of self-reliance and interdependence. Thank you, God, for the model of caring that we find in the stories of Jesus and throughout the Bible that assure us that we are never beyond your loving arms and that each of us is old enough to minister to another. O oh God, we who are younger need those who are older to teach us how it is to grow older and to set a model for us to follow in our aging process. And dear God, we who are older need those who are younger to teach us the ways of this technological world, to keep us thinking young, and to keep us from falling into the stereotype of old age. Grant that we may share our gifts with each other. Amen. Thank you, Jean Crow. Our hymn is the hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, hymn 438. May we stand as we sing together, all who are able. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. It concerns the issue of the early church. Should Christians be required to keep the traditions of the Jews? Listen to the word of God. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to the uncircumcised and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa. 
I was praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord. Nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. <coughs> this happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. <coughs> These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance for life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Martha. Martha, too, is a graduate of Peace College and the Assemblies Training School, which evolved into the Presbyterian School for Christian Education. Written curriculum for our denomination, married William McCorkle, and you know the rest of the story over the, the decades of service by both of them with their family. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, verses 31 through 38. Hear now God's word directed to us. When he had gone out, meaning Judas Iscariot, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Verily, truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As is typical for Many folks at some point in their lives, they need to sell their home and move into a retirement community. And that was so for John and Pat Madugan. 
of Pennsylvania who lived in a small community outside of a small city, a manufacturing of furniture town. And they were going to move into a Presbyterian retirement center some distance away. And they lived in their, they had lived in this residence, this home for over 45 years, and they had raised their family there, three children. However, they had not seen their youngest child in 20 years who lived in England. The two older children and their families lived in Pennsylvania, and they had visited frequently over the years, bringing their own children who loved to visit their grandparents. They publicly supported their parents' decision to sell and to move into the retirement community. But privately, they grieved to one another that the place they knew as home, the only place they knew as home, to which they had returned time and time again, would cease to exist because it would be closed. Ironically, the one who took us the, the hardest when they told him was their youngest brother, who lived in England who had not seen his, his parents for 20 years. In graduate school, he had dropped out because of drug addiction, and his parents, expressing tough love, had been horrified at what he had been doing and had really cut the money off and told him he had to get straightened out. And harsh words had been spoken, and wounds had been inflicted, and wounds had festered. There had not been reconciliation. Well, in due time, he did get himself straightened out, and he got a job and was transferred overseas and got promotion after promotion, and 20 years had passed. 20 years had passed. His two older siblings, a brother and a sister, knew how he felt, and they knew how their parents felt, that they really wanted deep down to be reconciled to their youngest child, their, their son. And so they called their brother in England and talked to him and convinced him that he needed to come home, not only to see the homestead for the last time, but to be reconciled to his parents. How would it all turn out? Would the power of love be powerful enough to connect and to include? That's the question which is addressed by our topic today. For on this Easter tide, we talk about the power of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection to release a power of love which forgives and includes and connects. On this Mother's Day, it is a particularly appropriate gospel lesson as we remember unconditional love which shaped us well, the focus for our sermon is this. All of our relationships are to be nurtured through the power of this love. And through the power of this love, we're able to move through failure by forgiveness to be connected and included. All of our relationships, all of the circle of our relationships are to be, are to be nurtured by the power of this love which moves through failure, through forgiveness, and which connects and includes. For unless that happens, friends, we shrivel up, we atrophy, and we die. It is interesting that this lectionary passage for this particular Sunday in Easter Tide from the Gospel of John is from a narrative just before Jesus is betrayed, arrested, crucified, and resurrected. However, the vision Jesus gives at this juncture transcends the chronological events yet to occur. Jesus gives a new commandment about love. It becomes the centerpiece for all relationships in Jesus' view. He says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. And, we, and we're thinking, well, what's new about this? That's what the scriptures are about. That's what the Old Testament is about, the scriptures for the New Testament church. Love is mentioned time and time again. It is standard in the Old Testament. What is new about this new commandment of love? Indeed, all of us have our favorite passages out of the Old Testament about love. 
from Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your Lord? So what's new about this love? Jesus quotes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy as he summarizes the Ten Commandments. In Luke 10 and Matthew 22 and Mark 12, he gives the Shema, it is called. And you know it, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus quotes from the scripture about love. Well, what's new about this new commandment of love? What is new about it is this. The saying of Jesus about a new commandment of love will be based now upon the example which Jesus as the Son of God will give through his impending sacrificial death. Love will have a new content shaped by sacrificial love, shaped by sacrificial love which acts for others even though, even though the individual knows that the others will not be able to act out perfectly the response appropriately. In other words, when we love, others are going to fail us. When we love, others are going to engage in prejudicial attitudes. When we love, Others are going to betray us. When we love, they might even persecute us. The content is a sacrificial love. It is new because the victory Jesus will accomplish on the cross and through the resurrection will release a power which will give followers the spiritual capacity not to be held victim to injustices or past failures or past temptations which either they have inflicted upon themselves or which have been inflicted upon them by others. It is new because of what Jesus is to do. And it will be the power which will become a powerful witness to what was accomplished through the cross and through the resurrection. That's why it is the appropriate text for this Sunday. How we witness to the fact of what Jesus did is communicated through how we practice the content of this new commandment on love, this sacrificial love. Jesus is aware of the vulnerability of his disciples prior to his death that they have an inclination for failure, for temptation, for betrayal, and betray Jesus they will. Judas has just left to enter into negotiations with the temple authorities to betray Jesus. Peter standing in front of him. Impetuous Peter will hear Jesus say, you can't follow me, and, and Peter will say, Lord, I will give my life for you. And Jesus gives the new commandment knowing that what Peter will say will be a statement which Peter will not be able to follow through on. What is new about this this new commandment of love is that it forgives ahead of time. And that blows our minds. Paul writes, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The content of this love is shaped by sacrificial love. God through Christ dies for us even knowing that we will betray him. Knowing that even after the resurrection when we should know better, we will still have to deal with prejudice as read about in Acts of the Apostles by Martha, the early Christian church, bickering about whether you had to become a Jew first before you could become a Christian, whether you could be a Gentile and come to faith. And there's the vision of, of animals which were thought to be unclean. It's dealing with the fact of prejudice, both religious prejudice, any kind of prejudice you can think of, racial prejudice, ethnic prejudice, social prejudice, economic prejudice, you can name it. The early church had to deal with that. Jesus gives this new commandment of the power of love, knowing that his followers will betray him even when they attempt to follow him, will yield to temptation even when they say they will not, as we do likewise. Thank goodness for the power of sacrificial love, which accepts us despite ourselves. And thank goodness for my parents who love me despite my vulnerability and my inclination not to follow always what they told me to do. And since this is Mother's Day, I can reflect with appreciation about the unconditional love of my mother who forgave time after time after time, knowing that when she forgave me once, there will be surely something I will do. And she'll have to forgive me again. And there will be another thing I will do. I may not do the same thing, but 
I did something else. Time after time after time. And that's the nature of sacrificial love, which reaches out through failure, through forgiveness, to include and to connect. Because outside of that connection, our spirits atrophy, our spirits shrink, and they die. I remember one incident as though it were yesterday, and there are many instances which are not appropriate to mention in public. Our family lived about four blocks from the elementary school. We attended in those days, uh, we went to elementary school and directly to high school, no middle school, no sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And my younger sister and I walked to school and back from the fourth grade on. In New Orleans, it was safe at that time. I would not recommend it now, but it was safe growing up in that era. In the seventh grade, when my sister was in the sixth grade, my mother and my father decided that in order to get the, quote, war chest ready for us to go to college, my mother would need to go back to work. And so in the seventh grade, she did our mothers. Back in those days, everybody in the neighborhood was your mother. You couldn't go outside the house without somebody knowing what you were doing. And so when we got home at 3.30, from 3.30 to 5, and my, when my mother got home, there were things we had to do. If we went outside to play, there was to be a note. We were to practice the piano or the flute or the piano. We didn't have to do uh, homework at that time. But always my mother said, you walk with your sister. Well, it was the fall of the year, football time. And that afternoon, I found out that we were to play another elementary school. It was sandlot football, pickup football. We didn't have uniforms. We just wore what we could find at home. And the game was that afternoon. Well, at 3.15, I was there waiting to go. And it seemed like an eternity. My sister didn't come. It was maybe five minutes. And I decided I would head home, run home, get dressed, and run back. And I didn't even see my sister coming home. We followed the same route. When I got back, I wasn't concerned about my sister. I'd forgotten about her. The game was what I wanted to be in. Well, my mother got home at 5 o'clock. There was no note. There was no younger sister, Jean. And there was no Edwin. I was called Edwin then, not Ed. She was scared and angry. And she came to school. Well, there was my sister. At some point, she had come downstairs. And since I was not there, the, sec the janitor let her stay in the vestibule. And she was still there in the vestibule, waiting for someone to walk her home. My mother retrieved my sister and seeing a bunch of boys in the back headed to get me. And I had another one of those teaching moments, <laughs> reinforcing what I was supposed to do. But my mother forgave me time and time again. It was a sacrificial love. It forgave me, knowing that somehow in the future I could not live up to perfection. I didn't want to disappoint my mother, but I always seemed to be yielding to some new temptation. I would not try to repeat what I'd done, but always, there was always something else out there. And that's the process of what we call sanctification in the growth of our faith, where we grow into this thing. Process of growing into faith, growing into holiness, dealing with temptation, dealing with it through forgiveness, trying to make amends, trying to... To, to do what is right. And my parents expressed unconditional love, and my mother did time and time again. Jesus. Jesus is talking about the quality of this new love, this sacrificial love. This new commandment is about the power of sacrificial love really to forgive ahead of time, and this is what Jesus is doing. When impulsive Peter says to Jesus, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. Jesus' response is that Peter will deny him three times. Jesus gives the new commandment. Jesus knows what he will do. And at Easter time, we celebrate the power of the crucifixion and the resurrection, and we celebrate how it is that we can witness to what was accomplished through the crucifixion and the resurrection. There has been this sacrificial power released, which can dwell in us, difficult as it may be, to enable us to reach out, to connect, and to include. Difficult as it may be. Because God has done that for us, we too are called upon to do it for others. This 
new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And so on this Eastertide Sunday, on this Mother's Day, we celebrate the power of love in family, in the community of faith. On this Eastertide Sunday, we claim the power of the sacrificial love of Jesus' new commandment, which sees in us our full potentialities past, our foibles, our limitations, our vulnerabilities, our failures, our blemishes, our yielding to temptation, our sinfulness. On this Eastertide Sunday, we acknowledge again that in all of our relationships, we are to be nurtured by a love which moves through failure, by forgiveness, which includes and connects, or connects and includes. And that is crucial for the power of the church to witness to the faith we profess. It is a sacrificial love, a love which forgives and forgives in the midst of human limitations. Thank goodness God has done that for you and me. And he calls upon us to do that for others, not only those in our family, but to witness to the faith to others who need to be affirmed in all of their worth, despite their foibles and limitations. I give you a new commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another just as I have loved you. When the power of sacrificial love is indeed practiced, Love does connect and include, and there is life, not death. Life of the Spirit, not death of the Spirit. Amen. In response to God's word, let us stand and affirm what we believe, using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are found on page 14 in the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Let us look to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we rejoice this day in your many gifts to us and give you thanks for our abundant blessings. We thank you especially for the gifts of spring, for flowers blooming, the sun shining, and gentle breezes stirring. We thank you for the gift of life, the joy of living, and for new life that is ours through Jesus Christ. On this Mother's Day, we remember our mothers and give you thanks for the love that they have given us. We remember special times with them and pray for those who may not have known a mother's love or whose memories are painful. We pray for mothers and families everywhere that they may be strengthened through your love and grounded in faith. We pray for all those with special needs this day. We remember those that are in the hospital or, or are convalescing at home. 
We pray for those in nursing homes and other care facilities and the homebound. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and feel the emptiness of life without them. We pray for those who suffer the pain of broken relationships, whose families have been splintered, who struggle with addiction or abuse of any kind. We pray for those who worry about loved ones, their health, their safety, their security, their wisdom. We pray for the world that we live in, where there is pain and suffering, war and violence, hunger and poverty. We pray for your church, which is called to be your body at work in the world and to bring hope, peace, and justice to others. May we boldly proclaim your message of love and carry it forth into the world to others. Give us courage to move beyond what is safe and comfortable and easy for us and to reach out to others who may be different from us. Help us to stretch ourselves including those who most need your love and care. For we make this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us present unto God our tithes and offerings. It's hard to get 
Let us pray. Gracious God, we pause today to give you thanks for your many blessings to us, especially for the gifts of family and love, for forgiveness and acceptance. We ask that you take these offerings that we bring and use them to further your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 439, In Christ There Is No East or West. Indeed, we are the beneficiaries as disciples of the Christ, of a sacrificial love, a love which includes us and connects us to God and to one another by a love which indeed acts beforehand, because that is what God did for us on the cross and through the resurrection. And we are called upon to witness to the content of this new love, this sacrificial love, and now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 